Welcome to the Psychology Podcast, where we give you insights into the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity. I'm Dr. Scott Barry Kaufman, and in each episode, I have a conversation with a guest who will stimulate your mind and give you a greater understanding of yourself, others, and the world we live in. Hopefully, we'll also provide a glimpse into human possibility. Thanks for listening and enjoy the podcast. Today, it's great to have Wendy Wood on the podcast. Wendy is Provost Professor of Psychology and Business at the University of Southern California. She has written for the Washington Post and the Los Angeles Times, and her work has been featured in the New York Times, the Chicago Tribune, Time Magazine, and USA Today, and on NPR. She lectures widely and recently launched the website Good Habits, Bad Habits to convey scientific insight on habit to the general public. Her latest book is called Good Habits, Bad Habits, The Science of Making Positive Changes That Stick. So great to chat with you today, Wendy. Oh, it's great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. My pleasure. So you're the world's leading expert on the science of habit change. But actually, my introduction to your research was not through that topic. It was uh, because I'm such a big fan of your work on gender differences. Oh, thank you. Well, that's nice of you to say that. Yes, I also study gender, but my current focus is mostly on habits. Great. I got really interested in studying how people stick to the changes that they make in their lives. What can we do to make those things that we really want to do persist? That has captured my focus for the past few years. In fact, I've been studying it for 30 years at this point. Yes. So was the gender differences thing kind of like a side hobby? Yeah. Yes. But yeah. To the extent that scientists have hobbies, yes. <laughs> right. Good point. So, yeah. So we're going to, obviously, if we're going to focus on habit change today. And I was reading the press materials for your book and it said, you know, we think we know how good and bad habits are formed, but we have it completely wrong. Now, is that a marketing ploy, or do you think that's right, that we have it completely wrong? And who's we? What, what do I have wrong? <laughs> <laughs> we is all of us. Habits are part of the unconscious, so we can't introspect about them. We, we don't have intuitions about them in the same way that we do other parts of our behavior, like when we make decisions to do something or have strong feelings about something in particular. Those are conscious experiences that we have and we recognize. Habits are something very different. They're part of the unconscious and they learn in different ways than our more conscious thinking selves. So is our conscious thinking selves always the better one the, of, the, of the angel devil? <laughs> Can our consciousness be the, the devil sometimes and our unconscious be what we want to happen? Yes. That's actually a pretty common um, misunderstanding about habits. And that's because I think our bad habits are just much more salient than our good ones. So we think about habits as things we don't want to do. But in fact, so many of our habits actually help us do things like when you drive, a lot of the time, you're not making active decisions. You're just doing what's worked in the past, what you've learned to do through repetition. And that's a great example of a habit because it's something that we do a lot and we do without thinking. Mm. And we have bad habits and obviously we have good habits now. So the point here, I guess, is to get as many of these good habits as I can get going so I don't have to like think about it consciously. Is that right? Exactly. Because habits persist much more readily than our conscious decisions. You know, we've all had the experience of New Year's resolutions where we are determined we're going to change our life around and do something different, maybe save more money, maybe work harder at our jobs, maybe exercise. And we might do it for a few weeks, but then after a while, it starts seeming less fun and less important. And so most of us quit. It's the failed New Year's resolution experience. And that's in part because we're relying on our conscious decisions and willpower to do it, which is what makes sense to most of us. That's how we think that we act and behave and get our behavior 
in line with our goals. But in fact, the way people who are successful at these things are doing it is they do it automatically. So they figured out how to sync up their habits, that automatic part of themselves that repeats what they've done in the past. They figured out how to sync that up with their conscious decision-making self. I see. So they're integrated? Yes, exactly. And all of this happens because we have multiple parts of our brain. Our brain isn't like this unified whole. We have parts that are are specialized for different functions. And part of our brains pick up on the repeated patterns that get us rewards in everyday life. And part of our brains, typically thought of as executive control or associated with the frontal lobes, is associated with making decisions and exerting willpower. And those two parts aren't always in, aren't always compatible. They're not always doing the same thing. That's for sure. And that's when when we have bad habits. So how do you define a bad habit? Question. Habits are only good or bad in relation to our current goals. So things that we start doing, because it seems like they're fun or they work for us in some way, can become habits that then turn out to be problems, like staying up late a few nights to watch Netflix or to play video games or to surf the web. You do that often enough and it becomes a habit and you're developing a pattern of insomnia. So the first few times you do it, it, it's could be fun, could be fine. It's just when it becomes a repeated pattern that it's a problem, and that's a bad habit. So don't we have all sorts of bad habits that we're doing all throughout the day that become these kind of habitual things like checking email and checking all sorts of playing on our iPhones and things like that? If we step back sometimes, we might realize, holy cow, I've really been caught up in these these bad habits. Yeah, we supposedly all check our cell phones over 50 times a day. And it's hard to imagine that most of us need to be doing that. I think we do it when we're bored. We check our cell phones when we're in social situations we don't want to be in. Maybe get in the elevator. There's people there you don't really want to talk to, so you check your cell phone. We use it. It's it's cued by all kinds of different experiences in our lives, and so we tend to overuse it. That's an interesting idea of, of overusing it. I mean, this notion there's no such thing as ob- objectively bad habits, and you said it's relative to your goals and. But, you know, we have so many goals that are always competing within ourselves. You know, we're cybernetic systems with so many conflicting goals. So how do you know which are, are going to bring out the best uh, version of your whole self? That's another good question. Um, Thanks, Wendy Wood. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think that the question of what goals to use to develop new habits has to do with what behaviors you want to repeat on a regular basis. I see. The behaviors like eating healthfully, saving money, particularly as we all get closer to retirement, eating healthfully, going to the gym, being responsive to our children and being there to listen to them. Those are all goals that We endorse pretty much every day, and it would be wonderful to not have to think about doing those things, but just do them automatically. And that's what the regular exercisers, the people with happy families, the people who are saving money effectively and living within their means, that's what they do. And that's the fascinating thing is until recently, we thought that self-control was required in order to not respond to temptations, to to exert self-denial, make sure that you are living a healthy, financially stable life. But instead, it turns out that 
the people who are doing these things on a regular basis are doing it automatically out of habit. And that's why I wrote this book, is I wanted to explain to people how they can do this too. Most of us don't know really a whole lot about our habits. I know there are lots of books out there. I know that there's lots of blogs and other sorts of posts about habits. And when I, I've uh-huh. done surveys and I've asked people, so how much do you know about your habits? And about 80% of people in my surveys say, I, I understand my habits. I know how they work. But then you ask them, so how successful are you at changing your behavior and making it stick? And those same people say, mm, not so great. So whatever we know about habits, it's not helping us. I think the science really can. What do you think of James Clear's new book? I don't comment on other people's, um, other people's work. I will say that there's an absence of books out there that actually are informed by the science, that can right. tell us something true for most of us. There's lots of books out there that tell us what works for the writer or what the writer thinks might work for us. But there's little hard data on what actually works. That's what I think is the difference between my book and the other books out there. Got it. Because there is uh, 30 years of hard data. You're just not distilled in a way that people can take and apply to their lives so easily. Exactly. Hey, everyone. If you find the themes we cover on the Psychology Podcast interesting and enlightening, you might be interested in my new book, Transcend, The New Science of Self-Actualization. The book is the culmination of my journey to scientifically discover the factors that can lead us to optimal health, growth, creativity, peak experiences, and deep fulfillment. I believe we could still manage to have peak experiences, the most wondrous moments that make life worth living, regardless of our current life circumstances we can choose growth. For more, you can visit transcend-book.com. That's transcend-book.com with a hyphen between the word transcend and the word book. If you get a chance to read the book, it'd be great if you could leave a review on Amazon, tweet about it, or share the book with friends. I truly hope this book can help people get through these tough times and realize that we all have greater resiliency, creativity, and potential within us than we ever realized. Okay, now back to the show. So you have this idea of friction and stacking. Could you please go into a little bit of detail about that? Yeah. So how you form a new habit is you have to repeat a behavior. It's not enough to make a decision. You can't just decide, oh, I usually eat cookies on the sofa at night and I'm going to change that. I'm going to do something else. I'm going to do jumping jacks instead or push-ups when I would normally eat cookies. It doesn't work that way. You develop Mm. a habit as you repeat the action. So your habit memory depends upon what you have done in the past, not your decision-making. You want to repeat the behavior in a supportive context that's going to make it easy for you to keep doing the same thing over and over. And you want to make sure that it's rewarding because people simply don't repeat things if they don't like them. So if you really hate exercising at the gym and you want to increase your fitness, then finding something else to do is what's going to be most helpful or add some reward to going to the gym. So for me, I find working out on the elliptical really boring, but I watch stupid TV shows when I do it. And there's no other time of the day do I do that. So working out on the elliptical has actually become a lot of fun for me. And that's what people need to do in order to get a behavior that might not otherwise be rewarding, something that they actually enjoy. That's interesting. Friction is the part of the context 
that makes it more difficult to do something. So we don't realize how much influence context has in our lives. And context is just everything around us. It's the situations we're in. It's the time of day. It's the other people around us. Proximity, how close things are to you is an important feature of context, and that can be real friction. Let me give you an example. A study tracked cell phones. We are, our cell phone use is being monitored all the time. You probably know this. A study tracked cell phones, how far they went to the gym. This is hundreds of thousands of cell phones over several months. How far they traveled to a paid fitness center. What they found is that if people traveled three and a half miles, they went five times a month on average. But if people traveled over five miles, they only went once a month on average. And what this suggests is that, I mean, first off, that difference of a mile and a half it doesn't make much sense to our rational thinking conscious self. Right. If you want to go to the gym, you're going to go to the gym and it doesn't matter how far away it is, but it makes it more difficult, takes a bit more time. You have to think more about how to get there. All of that adds friction to going to the gym. And so you're making it hard on yourself if you go to a gym that's a distance from your house or your job. You're much less likely to go. It's the difference between an exercise habit. And not having one. I see. So what differentiates those who have who score well in these self report measures than those who don't? What what are the what do the self controlled people have? Yeah, self control is an interesting concept because we think that that's what determines whether we're going to be successful at changing our behavior or not. Right? If you have good Mm self-control, strong ability to resist temptations, then you should be somebody who is able to make decisions and stick with them. If you have poor self-control, then you won't be able to do that. That's the way most Mm -hmm. of us think. So when we fail at our New Year's resolutions, when we're not able to meet our goals, then we tend to assume, ugh must be something wrong with my self-control. I didn't want it enough. Instead, what science has shown is that people who score high on self-control scales actually know how to form habits and they've automated the experience so that they don't need to rely on self-control. They're not even making decisions. It's their automatic response when they're in a situation. It's like you driving a car. When you're in that car, you're driving your familiar automobile, you don't have to make decisions most of the time unless something unusual happens in the traffic and then we hope you are paying attention. But most of the time, we're not. So that kind of autopilot is what high self-control people use to meet their goals. They understand about friction and they understand about making it easy for them to achieve goals in life. Oh, that's very interesting. So I I am naturally curious of your thoughts about ego depletion theory then. Have you done work on that at all? Kind of viewing this self-control as this kind of limited resource that is tied to like glucose in our brain? Yeah, I, I have not done anything with the glucose mechanism. I think there's a good question about that. The idea that self-control is a muscle, that it's depleted with use, that was very popular for a while and is now being questioned by many researchers. My explanation, I have done research in the area and I sometimes do get ego depletion effects so that people who have performed difficult tasks and are mentally tired, mentally depleted, they tend to fall back on their habits more than when people are more actively in control. 
And I think some of the controversy has come because the experimental work is not always ideally set up to capture that phenomenon. It's a bit more elusive than many of us imagined initially. Well, yeah, I think that uh, we're talking about such a complex mechanism, you'd, you'd sort of expect that. So why doesn't uh, white knuckling through temptation work? It's hard. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, not fun. No, most of us don't enjoy it. It's a hard approach to stick with simply because we don't enjoy it. And there was a very famous experiment done about 20 or 30 years ago by Dan Wagner with the difficulty of not thinking about white bears. Are you familiar with this? Oh, definitely, yes. What he showed in that study, for listeners who aren't familiar with it, what he Classic. showed in that study is that if you are trying not to think of something, it gives that thing energy so that when you are allowed to think of it in the future, you do so with great frequency. You think about it even more often after you've been trying to inhibit it. So the point to the study was to suggest that we have this sort of boomerang response, this counterproductive response when we try to inhibit something. It activates it further and we have a hard time not thinking about it. And we've all done this, right? When you diet, yeah. you think about food constantly. When you are trying not to spend money, you can't help but notice all the new things that other people are buying that you are denying yourself. This counterproductive quality makes it uh -huh. very hard for us to be successful at self-denial. It's not a good way to try to change our behavior. It's not going to work. I see. Well, it's good to know that there's other ways of getting at what you want to get at. Yes. One of the benefits of having a mind that has many different systems, interconnected systems, is that we have many different ways of learning and thinking. Some of them are accessible to us, we're aware of them, and some are not. And the habit system is not available for us to introspect about. We're learning habits all the time, and we're not aware of it. I'd like to take a moment to talk about our sponsor, BetterHelp. Is there something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals? For quite a lot of us right now during this coronavirus pandemic, we are struggling with our most fundamental basic needs, such as our needs for security, connection, and opportunities to master our work. I think all of us could use some therapy right now. I know I sure could, which is why I've really been enjoying working with a professional therapist at BetterHelp so I can realize the best version of myself, even under the current circumstances. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. And you can start communicating with your therapist in just under 24 hours. Note that it's not a crisis line and it's not self-help. It is professional counseling done securely online. There's a broad range of expertise available, which may not be locally available in many areas. In fact, the service is available for clients worldwide. What I really like about BetterHelp is that you can log into your account anytime and send a message to your counselor. You'll get timely and thoughtful responses, plus you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions so you won't ever have to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room as you typically have to do with traditional therapy. BetterHelp is really committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches, so they make it easy and free to change counselors if needed. It's more affordable than traditional offline counseling, and financial aid is available. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. Visit their website and read the testimonials that are posted daily. Here's a recent one, for example. Camilla helped me turn my life around. Everything has been so positive for me since our first session. Deep gratitude. I'm pleased to announce a special offer for listeners of the Psychology Podcast. You can get 10% off your first month of professional counseling by going to betterhelp.com 
forward slash psych podcast. That's better H E L P forward slash psych podcast. Join the over 800,000 people taking charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. Okay, now back to the show. Doesn't the habit system kind of operate in an if then sort of code, source code? In, in a way, yes, because the habit system really is a sort of mental shortcut. If I'm in this context, what should I do to get a reward? That's what the habit system answers. Mm. And it's actually the question it asks is, what have I done in the past that has gotten a reward? So when you wake up in the morning, you go to your kitchen, I go to my kitchen, I make coffee without even asking myself how, or do I want it today? Or will my day be better with it or without it? I just make it. I do what I did in the past to get that reward of a morning jolt to help you wake up. But the problem is that this is where you get into bad habits, that the habit system is very backward focused. It focuses on past rewards, what you experienced as a reward in the past. It doesn't recognize so well what you want to get as a reward today. So if you decide that coffee isn't good for your health, you may still find yourself thinking about it as soon as you get up in the morning because that's what you've typically done. And that's what your brain is organized to to focus on first thing in the morning, making coffee. That's your habit. So if I want to change a habit, do, do we know how many, do we have a certain like uh, idea of how many days such a thing will take? People say you could change any habit in 21 days. Is, is that another thing that people just pull out of their ass that's not informed by science? That, yes, that is not very scientifically based. In fact, we think that it, if you're interested in the origins, we think it comes yeah. from a self, self-help book in the 1960s. On how long it takes to get used to a plastic surgery change in your face or appearance of some kind. Oh, <laughs> so, wow. <laughs> That's amazing you track that down. Yeah. It doesn't have much to do with habit formation or change. More changes in our appearance. To form a habit takes much longer typically than three weeks. Two to three months is a better estimate. If you're doing it reasonably consistently and you're getting rewarded for it, so you like what you're doing and you're likely to do it again in the future, then two to three months is probably the best estimate we have at this point for actions to become so automated that they're sort of second nature. They're what you do without having to think or make decisions. That's how long it will take. Changing habits is something very different. And this is odd to think about for our conscious decision-making self. But once habits have formed, Rewards don't make a whole lot of difference. In fact, the consequences of the action become relatively unimportant. And that's what researchers call the gold standard for knowing whether something is a habit. If you change the context, will people still keep doing it? If you change the reward, Will people keep doing it? Change the Mm. outcome of the Mm. behavior. That's the gold standard of whether something is a habit or not. And let me give you an example of that. I did a study a few years ago in a local movie cinema. And we gave people stale popcorn to eat. Actually, some got a bag of fresh. Some got a bag of stale. They didn't know that they were getting that anyone was getting stale popcorn. They thought it was all fresh. And people who had habits to eat popcorn in the movie cinema, they ate it, whether it was stale or fresh. 
It could tell us they hated the stale and it was awfully stale. So it was really not good popcorn, Mm. but they ate it anyway because they were in a movie cinema with all of the cues around them activating the habit and the outcome, the taste, the reward didn't matter that much. People who didn't have habits to eat popcorn in the movie cinema, they ate the fresh stuff and avoided the stale. So they were acting rationally the way we'd expect people to act. But the people with habits were just repeating what they did before because in the past it had been rewarding. And so the habit perpetuated. Well, that's a great study for a sadistic psychologist to administer. (laughs) (laughs) Not saying you're a sadistic psychologist, but I'm saying (laughs) someone might enjoy that. (laughs) The whole idea was to test the limits to which people would go to repeat habits. And that was the idea behind the study. And what it suggests is that you can't change habits by changing rewards, right? By finding some new reward that might work for some other behavior. That's a common meme that is suggested in the popular literature for changing habits. But in fact, habits don't work that way. You have to change the cues that activate the behavior. Yeah. So in order to change a habit, you have to add friction or remove the cues so that it's harder to do and it doesn't come to mind automatically. Can you give like an example on how I can stop picking my nails? Well, let me give you an even more impressive one, which is, has to do with smoking. Our country decided about 50, 60 years ago to start putting friction on smoking. We started taxing the purchase of cigarettes. We removed advertising, cigarette advertising. We banned smoking from most public places. And we removed it from the store shelves. You can't buy cigarettes by picking up a pack in the store. Someone has to check your age and give it to you. All of those things added friction to smoking. And in so doing, we cut smoking from almost 50% of the population of smokers to only 15% today, which shows the power of the context we're in to change our behavior because it changed what was easy. It was no longer, it was like everyone was now in that um, five miles away from the gym study. Mm. And they, it was hard to get there. It just starts being too much work. And after a while, the discouragement makes it easier to change. So what would you do to add friction to um, biting your nails or picking at them? Or that's a habit that many people have. Putting cyanide on my fingernails. Ah, Yep. There you go. (laughs) So I don't, I certainly wouldn't bite them. (laughs) Or it it would be what we call one trial learning. Um, Yes, that's true. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, put something unpleasant, unpleasant tasting on your nails or wear gloves so you have to take them off, particularly mm. at times when you know that you typically bite your nails. It could be that you do it because you get anxious, maybe when you're working or during difficult conversations. Those times are the times to practice automating sitting on your hands, wearing gloves, painting your nails with something that tastes bad. All of those things will help you in the future to stop biting. They add friction. Just wanted to take this moment to thank you all for your support of the podcast over the years. If you'd like to further support the podcast, I wanted to let you know a few things you could do to help make this podcast a better experience for you all. First, I'd really appreciate it if you could subscribe to the Psychology Podcast on iTunes. This would help make the show more prominent on iTunes and increase our listenership. 
I believe you can subscribe both on your iPhone and on your computer. Second, it'd be great if you could subscribe to our YouTube channel, where you'll find videos of many of these conversations. Just search for The Psychology Podcast on YouTube. Third, it'd be great if you could give the show a rating and review on iTunes. I definitely read all the reviews, and they're helpful to others who are thinking about giving the show a listen. Finally, if you really want to show some love, you can donate something to the show. Even just the price of a cup of coffee would really help me continue to do this podcast for you all. To donate something, you can go to thepsychologypodcast.com and click on the link at the bottom that says Become a Sponsor. Thanks again for your incredible support of the show over the years. I do this show for you all because I truly love sharing my enthusiasm and love of the mind, brain, and creativity, and I really appreciate you joining me on this journey. Okay, now back to the show. Well, uh, thanks for this free advice here. I appreciate it. I've been trying to think, what's the difference between habits and addiction? Is, or is just addiction just a habit that has become so repetitive that you feel like it's interfering with your longer-term goals? I mean, how would you define the distinction between the two? Well, I think habits are a component of most addictions, but addictions are something more. Addictions are, at least with substance. using substances to a point where you sort of lose control over the rest of your life. Addictions hijack this habit learning system, but addictions have many other components as well. So they're like a really bad habit run amok. They are, they take over people's lives in ways that most habits don't. Most of our habits are just much more circumscribed to specific contexts so that when we're in the context, the response we've practiced comes to mind. And that's just a shortcut for what to do. And we usually just do it. I see. So you're talking about, I mean, you're talking about a lot of using friction to change our habits. How does, how do companies like Uber reduce friction in user experience? Well, if you remember a few years ago, Uber had this pricing schedule where you would get this lightning bolt. It would say that prices have increased say 1.5% and you would be you would get this surcharge this additional charge for every for for the ride that you wanted to take and the problem with that is those of us who have a an uber habit that made us start to think it was a very bad idea and uber quit that <laughs> hmm. because figured out that it was friction on people using Uber. You're Mm. making people think and making people make decisions about whether to take the ride right now or not. And that's the last thing Uber wants. As any company, you just want people to be using your product automatically and not wondering, huh, do I really want to go in this ride right now? So that, can, that, that pricing structure has since changed, and we only get a standard price for the Uber ride that's sort of an average. They have average. They have better data, so they're averaging the cost. I see. Well, I now understand this link. I was trying to see what's in common between that gender differences research you've done in this topic. And, I mean, you're really big into the context. You're big into context and the environment. You, you could imagine, like, Robert Pullman would he'd just, he'd be like, you know, it's about, it's about the genes. It's, about, it's a trait perspective. There are people with self-control, and that's influenced by the genes, you know. But it sounds like you've invoked the G word once. No. I, everyone has the ability to learn habits. In fact, that is common across all the mammalian species. So rats have habits, dogs have habits, cats have habits, whales have habits. We are all genetically endowed to form habits in similar ways. Hmm. What we find pleasurable and enjoyable and what our goals are those 
might be influenced to some extent by our genetic structure and certainly by our child rearing and developmental experiences. But the habit mechanism itself is pretty basic and it's common to all mammalian species, as I said. And this really gets, this research program really gets the heart of how much we can change our, you know, personalities, our personality traits, just repeated habits of emotional functioning, behavioral manifestations, person, et cetera, motivational processes. I mean, you must take a habit, a perspective on personality as well, I guess. No, I wouldn't argue that. I don't think habits are personality traits. No. Um, habits are the repeated behaviors that we've learned to do in certain situations because we've been rewarded for, for them in the past. And personality traits are something quite different. You'll need to ask a personality psychologist. Well, I'm a personality <laughs> psychologist. <laughs> yeah, sure. well, there you go. Okay. But I was thinking that William Fleeson's his approach, he's like, you know, he has this idea. He's like, you're, you're only more extroverted or more agreeable or more moral to the extent to which you repeatedly are those things. So it just had me thinking that it seems like the habit approach could probably be integrated with the William Fleeson sort of way of thinking about personality uh, traits as density as distributions. People who are more introverted just are more introverted. It's not like they're always introverted. They're just more on the four or five out of five, you know, Likert scale during the course of their day on average. So isn't that essentially like their habit is to be more introverted? I think, I think probably what could frame it that way. Yeah, possibly. The habits that we have studied thus far are more discrete, specific behaviors. Yeah, yeah, I see. And that introversion might lead people to practice certain behaviors that could be helpful or could be hurtful to them in the long run. So they might form good or bad habits because of who they are, their preferences, their likes, their attitudes, their approach to life. Yeah. yeah. I mean, your research gets to the heart of so much of what uh, people really care about in their lives, which is how much can they change? How can culture? I mean, again, I, I'm going to keep going back to your gender difference stuff because I thought it was really, I mean, your gender difference work actually made an impact on my research. Yeah. And you did this work and there was this kind of like the an evolutionary hypothesis. There was a cultural role hypothesis, what explains me preferences across different cultures? And you sort of had this hybrid model. Yes. So the basic idea in our approach, this was with Alice Abley that I did this work. The basic idea behind our approach was that, yes, men and women have um, potentially different genetic orientations Men might be oriented to do certain things, women other things. But what makes the human species so, what's made us so successful is culture. And the ways that culture determines men's and women's activities in our society is really a huge determinant of what we think men and women are like. So in our society, women work, good percentage of women work, maybe 60, 70%, almost as much, much as men, but they tend to work in slightly different jobs, not as well paid. Um, they tend to work in caretaking jobs. You still see them more than men as elementary school teachers, nursery school teachers, nurses, those, those distributions are changing, but it's still the case that women tend to be in more caretaking positions. So we make the inference, women must have those attributes. And men tend to be in more higher status, higher paying positions in the workforce. And they're less likely to be stay-at-home dads than women are being stay-at-home stay moms. So 
We make the inferences about what men should be like based on our experience of men in our culture. And the basic argument is that our stereotypes reflect our understanding of what men and women do in our specific culture. Do you think that motivation plays a role there? Surely more women on average than uh, men on average are interested in, in the caretaking professions, right? Yeah, but we've seen those that change radically in the last couple of decades. Many more women than men are now graduating from college. We see women being interested, equally interested or or more interested than men in biology, biological sciences. So graduates in biology are leaning, starting to lean more towards women than men. That's true at the undergraduate level. That's becoming true also at the graduate level. The idea that we have these fixed interests just doesn't seem to match very well the historical data. Yeah, so I, I'm just trying to understand the position. I thought that your position was that you, you certainly don't deny that there are some biological contributions. Sure. But yeah, but but you're talking about this interaction effect because I think that one could probably make a good case that that something hasn't changed. I, I don't think that that women are just as interested in social status and and dominance, you know, of like a leadership thing as as men are on average. That seems, that seems to be a pretty robust sex difference, and I'm I'm wondering. I mean, would you argue there's no biological contribution whatsoever to that sort of thing? No, I would never argue that, but I would point yeah. out that women are, do not have access to those positions as much as men do. Is that so, because of the patriarchy? Because of patriarchy. So it's very hard to tease apart what is actually due to an inherited disposition and what is actually due to the social circumstances that we find ourselves in. And I think that right there is just this common thread throughout your whole career that I, I now see. I now clearly see it. I, I was I was trying to figure it out. I was like, well, how, how did how does this the gender difference research link to this? But I think that, you know, you really have spent your career showing that regardless of all these other theories and things about and uh, and and heritability research, behavioral genetics, and and other aspects, there's still a, quite a bit of wiggle room there in terms of how we can change and and particularly our habits that we may feel like are cast in stone forever. You're kind of taking another look at that. Is that right? Exactly. Yay! Oh, I'm glad I, I could I could summarize that. Well, thank you for um, your your tremendous career, Wendy. Seriously, it's a very impressive uh, putting it all together in this book that's very digestible and very very easy to read and apply to one's life. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you for having me. I hope people have a chance to read the book. And thanks again for being on the Psychology Podcast. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Psychology Podcast. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion below. Also, please add a rating and review of the podcast on iTunes, and subscribe to the Psychology Podcast YouTube channel, as we're really trying to increase our viewership on YouTube. Thanks for being such a great supporter of this podcast, and be sure to tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.